Hi students, today we're going to talk about macromolecules um, that are big molecules. Macro means large. And these are some of the important large molecules that are found in and throughout the cells. Uh, they have various uh, types. There are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And those are the four big classes of macromolecules. These have various structures and functions. And first, let's talk about how they are created. Uh, macromolecules are created through a process called dehydration synthesis, which removes water, hence the name dehydration. Um, so these macromolecules are usually made up of single units called monomers. And monomer 1 will have a hydroxyl group, an OH group attached to it. Monomer 2 will have a hydrogen attached to it. And they're separate until the H and the OH combine to form water and leave. And then those monomers can stick together. And this will make a polymer uh, a large molecule. Polymers, poly means many, mono means one. So a polymer is um, a group of monomers. Uh, this is called polymerization. It's a type of polymerization. Now, once we have a big polymer, we can cut it apart using hydrolysis. Um, that is when we add water, hydro means water, and we split apart the polymer. Lysis means splitting. This picture shows it fairly well, where at the top of this slide, uh, two monomers are next to each other. And there's a little bit of a typo there with the H. It's a little funny looking. Um, to get those monomers to stick together, we need to remove the water. And then the monomers can bond. Um, down at the bottom, we're looking from the bottom up there, um, two monomers are connected. When we add water, we kind of dissolve that bond and the monomers can separate. That's hydrolysis. So a polymer is a molecule made up of many repeating units. Those units are called monomers. Polymers are many of our macromolecules. So this kind of goes back to chemical evolution in the Oprah and Hale Dane theory of chemical evolution. This is discussed in your textbook, and it's really interesting that um, the chemicals on Earth started as small organic compounds um, and even smaller uh, uh, substances. There was hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas, and they bonded with carbon to form those small organic molecules. Um, then those small organic molecules formed mid-sized molecules that linked up together to form big molecules, and eventually, if those molecules were able to replicate, a sign for life. Um, please check out this video on YouTube. It's a good video to il illustrate this chemical evolution process and how it leads to biological evolution. Um, I have up here concept map because this um, section, this chapter, these chapters with the macromolecules uh, really lend themselves to concept mapping. Um, these are chapters three, four, five, and six. And you are going to be looking at um, the different macromolecules and each one has some properties that can be mapped. So the first type of macromolecule we want to talk about is the carbohydrates. Um, these are types of sugars, and the monomer for these are monosaccharides, single sugar molecules. Monosaccharides are the smallest type of carbohydrate, and they can exist on their own, or they can exist as polymers, as polysaccharides. So monosaccharides, let's talk about these. These are simple sugars, as I said. They're soluble in water and sweet to the taste. There's a picture of glucose on the screen, and glucose is blood sugar. Um, there's also different types of monosaccharides, fructose and galactose, uh, ribose and deoxy deoxyribose, which are found in genetic material. So these all have carbon rings to them and uh, have the general formula as CH2O. What that means is that for every carbon and oxygen, we'll have carbon and oxygen in the same amounts. There is twice the amount of hydrogen. 
So glucose has a chemical formula C6H12O6. Um, and fructose has the chemical formula C5H10O5. The hydrogens are always in twice the amount. Here are some pictures of monosaccharides. Um, so you should be able to recognize these rings as being monosaccharides. We've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And here you can count all the hydrogens, carbons, and oxygens to see that um, two to one ratio of hydrogen to carbon. A disaccharide happens when two monosaccharides bond together through dehydration synthesis, through the dehydration reaction. Um, so these are essentially two sugars bonded together. They're still soluble in water and sweet to the taste. Um, and you can see a picture of one on the screen. Uh, sucrose is an example of a disaccharide. Sucrose is a molecule of glucose bonded to a molecule of fructose. And that's what's shown in the picture. Uh, sucrose is common table sugar. So it's very common, but very sweet, and we can relate to that in everyday life. Maltose is a glucose molecule bonded to another glucose molecule through the dehydration reaction. Maltose is malt sugar. Um, it's a sugar that we find in grape nut cereal. Malted barley contains a sugar. You use malt sugar to brew beer. It's got a very specific type of flavor to it. And this picture shows some common disaccharides. Uh, you can see lactose up there. Lactose is galactose bonded to glucose. Um, and that's milk sugar. So polysaccharides are polymers of monosaccharides. They are low in solubility and not sweet. Polysaccharides are sometimes called complex carbohydrates in nutrition class. Um, these are starches, um, and starches are polymers of many glucose molecules together. Uh, glucose can bond together in these strings of dozens, hundreds of um, mono monomers. And this is a way to store glucose in short-term energy storage for the, sh for the cell. Um, plant starch is an example. Amylose is cornstarch. And we have starches stored in our cells in the form of glycogen. This is found in our liver and our muscle cells. And so glycogen is bonded up glucose and it needs to be broken apart for the cell to be able to use it for energy. That's why we have carbohydrates. We break them down for energy. Um, and so these starches need to be broken apart so those single sugars can be used for energy. Monosaccharides like glucose can easily be converted to cellular energy. Here is a picture of a starch uh, found in potatoes. Um, this is amylose in potato cells. And over here we can see the cell wall and those little things inside it that actually look like potatoes themselves are starch granules. If we were to look at the chemical nature of this, we would see this branched amylopectin and amylose. And this is what it looks like in our liver cells. Uh, this is glycogen, same basic structure, a little different branching pattern. These are glucose molecules bonded together. Now you've probably already read a bit about lipids in the chapter on membranes, but let me tell you some of the basic uh, chemical properties of lipids. Lipids are insoluble in water, so they're not able to be dissolved by water. Um, they contain repeating carbon two hydrogen units, H CH2 units. Um, these are often called fatty acid chains. So if you can imagine a carbon with two hydrogens attached to it, carbons attached to another carbon, two hydrogens attached to it, till we get to the end and there are three hydrogens attached to it. Um, so these carbon-hydrogen chains uh, are nonpolar, and that means that lipids are hydrophobic, insoluble in water. Uh, lipids for the cell function in long-term energy storage. So in the cell, these 
long-term energy storage molecules are fats and oils. They're called triglycerides. And these can be either saturated or unsaturated. At the top of the screen here, we see corn oil. And this is an example of an unsaturated fat. Um, unsaturated fatty acid chains have double bonds to them. And you could see them highlighted in yellow. Those bonds called, uh, cause kinkiness in the fatty acid chain or bending. Um, be, and the bending means that the chains can't pack as tightly. So we have more fluidity in our fats. Oils and uh, other vegetable um, fats, other vegetable oils are uh, rich in these unsaturated fatty acids and are all liquid at room temperature. It's called unsaturated because the fatty acid chain is not completely full of hydrogens because of the double bonds with the carbon. Uh, carbon can bond to four other, can form four bonds. And so if you look closely, all the carbons have four bonds to them. So the double bonds mean that carbon is full in its outer shell and it has a double bond to another carbon, bonded to another carbon and hydrogen. In the bottom of the screen, you can see a saturated fatty acid. It's straight and contains all single bonds. This causes the fatty acids to pack very tightly because they are just lines and they can really squeeze together. No, bond, no bending of the molecule here. Um, this tight packing means that the fats are solid at room temperature, um, like butter. Butter is rich in these saturated fatty acids. Uh, lard is rich in saturated fatty acids. As I said, these are called triglycerides, and what that means chemically is that we have a glycerol molecule backbone, which is carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens. And this is attached to three of those fatty acid chains. Tri means three. Glyceride refers to the glycerol. So it looks like this. We have our glycerol, and then it bonds to the fatty acids, and that means a triglyceride, three fatty acids there. Another type of lipid is the phospholipid, and here is something that you heard about in the membrane chapter. Phospholipids are derived from triglycerides in that they have a glycerol backbone, um, but that glycerol is attached to two fatty acid chains, nonpolar, and a phosphate group. Um, that's sometimes called the phosphate head. The phosphate group is polar. If you remember back to chapter two, um, phosphate is a functional group, OPO3. Okay, so this type of molecule, this type of lipid, has a nonpolar end to it and a polar end. So part of it, the polar part, dissolves easily in water. The nonpolar part does not. And this acts as a barrier for the cell membrane. We have our, our polar water-loving heads inside the cell and outside the cell, and those fatty acid tails um, kind of forming that fatty, um, impermeable um, section of the membrane. And this is what a phospholipid looks like. We have our glycerol and that polar phosphate group, and then we have the fatty acid tails. Right here, we've got an uh, unsaturated tail, and this one happens to be saturated. Um, some other lipids that you will find um, are steroids, which don't really look like the other types. These are lipids with four fused carbon rings. Um, steroids can be things like cholesterol or estrogen or testosterone. These are all uh, lipid derivatives. Next, we'll talk about proteins and nucleic acids. So a protein has the subunit or monomer of the amino acid. Um, amino acids will bond together with a certain type of bond called a peptide bond. Um, and polymers of amino acids are called peptides. And when we have lots of um, amino acids in a line, amino acid, amino acid bonded together through that dehydration reaction, we have a polypeptide, many peptides together. Um, those 
peptides, those polypeptides, can bend and fold in different ways and eventually form a protein. Well, we're going to talk about that. There are 20 different types of amino acids um, found in living organisms. All amino acids have a hydrogen, a carboxyl group, one of the functional groups, COOH, an amino group, NH2, another functional group, all surrounding a central carbon atom. And the last part of that carbon, the last bond that carbon makes is to a unique R group. The R group is what defines the amino acid. So we've got a carbon, it needs to bond, have, form four bonds, forms the H, it's got a bond with the carboxyl, a bond with the amino, and the R group. Those R groups will determine the reactivity of the molecule, and sometimes sulfhydryl groups can form disulfide bridges, causing proteins to bend. So here we have the 20 amino acids found in the human body. Um, and you can see in each of these, the central carbon attached to a hydrogen sticking up top. The amino group is off to the left, the carboxyl group's off to the right, and the R groups are pointing down and they're all highlighted in blue. So you can see they vary significantly in their structure. So as I said, proteins are amino acids joined together with peptide bonds. Okay. Um, so these proteins form polypeptides, and there are lots of possibilities for a polypeptide. With 20 different amino acids, um, you can arrange these in lots of different ways. We can have polypeptides that are a dozen um, amino acids long or even longer. And there are so many possibilities because we can have valine, arginine, um, guanine, all diff in different arrangements. And it's like forming words with an alphabet. We've got 26 letters in our alphabet and we could form millions of words with that. Um, here we have 20 amino acids and we can form millions of uh, different proteins. Um, it's really fascinating. With our language, we're limited with the length of a word and how long we can speak and how many syllables. With the uh, proteins, there's no limit to how long it can be, so we can have so many possibilities. So amino acid chain is a polypeptide. This is the primary structure of a protein. And there are four levels to protein structure. So this is the first. Um, so we can have polypeptides 10 amino acids long. Uh, there are 20 to the 10th possibilities for the polypeptide there. So you can imagine how many different polypeptides we can form and how many different proteins we can end up with. <clears throat> so once we have a polypeptide, it will fold and um, the formation of hydrogen bonds along the backbone will form the secondary structure of the protein, the second level of structure. Uh, this can either be an alpha helix, which is a spiral, or a beta pleated sheet, which is like a zigzag. Um, then side chains can interact, side chains on the R groups. This can cause hydro hydrogen bonding or hydrophobic interactions where there's a repelling charge or van der Waals reactions, uh, weak attractions due to the movement of electrons. We can also have sulfur-sulfur covalent bonds forming between amino acids. And all this can cause that bent or spiral polypeptide to form in uh, another structure. So to give you an idea of that, here we've got our primary protein structure, the polypeptide chain, then secondary structure, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. Then the tertiary structure can form. It's kind of like a jumble. And the quaternary structure of a protein uh, consists of more than one polypeptide bonding together. So we've, we'll have multiple polypeptides coming together to form a protein. Here's a bigger picture showing that. You should be able to recognize these different structures, um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Um,
proteins, once they're formed, can um, do a variety of things for the cell. They can be enzymes, they can be transport proteins, they can help make up the plasma membrane or have a variety of functions in the cell. Um, but proteins can be permanently changed or denatured and that's kind of like killing a protein even though a protein is not technically alive. It's more like cooking a protein. So changes, dramatic changes in pH can cause a protein to be permanently changed and altered. Salt concentrations can change proteins. Um, solution base, temperature can all unravel and denature the protein. So when you cook a protein, imagine an egg in a frying pan. You get the pan really hot, you pop the egg in there, and right as the egg comes out of the shell, it's, it's got this white that's clear to it, the albumin. Um, when that hits the hot pan, it starts to turn white. That's a sign of denaturation. So that high temperature has unraveled the protein um, and that will be permanent. You can't uncook an egg. So this can happen with things in the cell as well um, at the cellular level and can lead to problems for the cell. So what do proteins look like? There are lots of different proteins out there. Here is hemoglobin. This was an example in an earlier slide where you can see the four different colors on that um, quaternary structure on the left. Those are different polypeptides, four come together. Hemoglobin's found on red blood cells. And that central iron, the Fe in the middle on the right, um, attracts to oxygen. And so hemoglobin is responsible for carrying oxygen on our red blood cells. This is another protein. It's more of a um, fibrous protein. And this is collagen, which is found in our um, skin, in our hair. Here's another picture of a protein. You can recognize the protein by the N. Amino groups all have that nitrogen. And so if you see something with an N, a molecule with an N, it's likely a protein. Here is another protein, and you can see the N right here. And lastly, we're going to talk about nucleic acids. Um, nucleic acids are DNA and RNA in the cell. These are made up of monomers called nucleotides. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's our genetic material, makes up chromosomes. And RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's um, similar to DNA in structure, but has a different function. While DNA holds our genetic information, RNA um, helps to transport that information to parts of the cell and helps to assemble proteins to express the DNA. DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, and RNA is found in the nucleus and also in the cytoplasm. So a nucleotide monomer actually has three small parts to it. There is a nitrogenous base, okay, so a nitrogen-rich base. We got nitrogen again. Uh, we've got a sugar, a five-carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. And here are two uh, nucleotides. The phosphate group is bonded to the sugar, which is bonded to the base. Some of the bases are single rings, those are called pyrimidines. Some of the bases are double rings, those are called purines. There are uh, five different bases in our nucleotides. Adenine and guanine both have double rings to them, and I won't ask you to memorize the differences to, of adenine and guanine. Um, pyrimidines are single rings, and these are cytosine and thymine, which are found in DNA and uracil, which is found in RNA in place of thymine. Um, and with the pyrimidines, I don't expect you to differentiate them as either. You should recognize the difference between a purine and pyrimidine, however. So here is a couple pictures of DNA. It's a double-stranded molecule where the sugars and phosphates can form this outer ribbon-like structure, and the bases are connected in between. 
So adenine bonds to thymine, and cytosine always bonds to guanine, and those are bonded with hydrogen bonds in the center of DNA. If you remember back to chapter two, hydrogen bonds are weak bonds and easily broken. Here is RNA showing guanine as a G, uracil as a U, adenine as an A, and cytosine as a C. You'll notice here there's no thymine. Um, and these have ends to them. There's a five prime end to RNA and DNA and a three prime end. Um, so you see the difference here. The five prime, prime end has the phosphate sticking up and the three prime end is the other end of the molecule where the sugar is the lowest part. So five prime end is the phosphate. The three prime end has the sugar. So I hope that helps you with your study of um, macromolecules and we will uh, continue on this journey with the macromolecules and see a little bit more about how they relate to this cell in the next coming chapters.